We nicknamed it Snowmageddon and also the Texas Tundra. It was Valentine's Day. We live in this off-grid cabin in the summer. He has a lot of different, you know, systems. We call his system. So the last day, running out of gas. So we're like, okay, we gotta go out. We gotta go out. Thank God we have four-wheel drive. We're still sliding, you know, because remember, it snowed and snowed and snowed and snowed. And Texas, literally, the entire state froze over. And Texas is a huge state. So, and I was listening to one of, you know, the woman who was talking about the hurricane in Florida, how people, you know, start acting a little bit crazy and a natural disaster happens. We didn't really experience looting or anything, but we did experience like we went to the first gas station that was close to us. They were sold out. The next gas station sold out. The next gas station sold out and on and on and on. And finally, my husband's like, Where do, should we turn around? I'm like, no, we're out here. We're already slipping and sliding. Let's just get the gas we need. controversy in Texas about, you know, even the governor's race, they thought he would lose his race because, you know, the power grid failed. And as we speak right now, even though I'm not in Texas, I'm here in the UP, we did, we were starting to have rolling blackouts uh, because of our extreme heat. No one in Texas thought that it would be, that the whole state could freeze over. I mean, it's unheard of. You know, I think people need to understand that this is our new normal, but living off grid up here in our summer home kind of gave my husband and I an advantage. The night before, I was I watched the news like a hawk, and I saw that we were supposed to get, you know, once in a lifetime storm. And so I told my husband, I said, honey, let's run up to the corner store and get some gas for the generator. I said, no, I just have a really bad feeling. Just bear with me on this. And so we went to the corner store and I said, let's just grab a couple of more bottles of wine and some beer. And we got wine and beer and he filled up all of his gas, to, you know, he didn't really want to, but he just, he went with the flow and the next day the snow started and we thought, oh, it's just, you know, this is nice. It's, Valentine's Day, we're not gonna be able to go out, but no big deal, we've got wine, we'll have a fire. The power went out. And thank God we have that generator. We have this big old clunky radio stereo that we bring up here when we didn't have Wi-Fi at the cabin so we could listen to the oldies. So <laughs> I found the AM radio station and then they were like, okay, there's these rolling blackouts. And you know, later on the next day, that early that about mid-morning, I, I have a friend that works for the local power company. And I call him and I say, hey Ed, what's going on? And he's like, hey, I said, what are we going to do? He goes, you may have to go live in your car for the week. He goes, I've got to run. My phone's blowing up. And so I go to my husband. I'm like, Ed says we may have to go in our car. And he's like, no, we'll be fine. So we, you know, I have a ton of candles. So I have lanterns. My daughter's a wedding floor. So I have all these supplies of candles and lanterns and votives. And I just, okay. So we started closing off rooms. I got towels and we closed off all the rooms and then we stuffed towels. And then, and then I thought, okay. This is not good enough because I went to touch the window. The windows were freezing, the rooms were freezing, and the temperature was hovering from the house right around, I'd say, 45. So I went and I stuffed towels, blankets around the window sills, shut off the room, towels and blankets underneath the door. And we were okay. You know, we had firewood. We had a lot of food in the refrigerator and in the freezer. So we were without power for five days. And I know this doesn't sound a lot. Uh, to some of the hurricane people and the earthquake people but for us in texas it was something we had never experienced before so a lot of us just you know weren't prepared we knew we would survive we knew we could make it we just you know how comfortable were we going to be and the way we kept ourselves warm was we you know kept the fireplace going just like back in the pioneer days you know you keep that fire during the day and then you reduce it to add to the hot coals to keep it for the next day it's about the third day we realized, okay, our power's not coming back on. The radio, the news were saying, rolling blackouts, rolling blackouts. Uh, you will get power. It turned on for like five minutes one day. And we were like, yay! It went back off. And then, we, you know, of course I'm plugging in to my husband's little gener his little mini console thing. It's like an inverter that has plugins for our cell phones. And it has a couple of, you know, 120s. Uh, for people who know what 120s are, it's just a regular standard plug. So we had that radio plugged in. We were hearing the news. We were communicating with our family checking make sure everybody was safe but since we didn't live close to either a school or a hospital or a police station and our neighborhood's kind of like the, at the end of our town we were all without power for five and a half days some of us you know several weeks and when I say it was catastrophic for people there were you know close to a little bit over 250 deaths and then people's homes started flooding when you know the pipes froze and especially the people that had um, swimming pools and so you know, a lot of people were getting to the hotel so they could have power, but we knew we were going to survive. It was just, we were going to be a little cold, but we were going to have food. You know, we have food. And so what I did was like normal people, whatever's in the refrigerator, we eat first, you know? So we, we went through that first and I cooked a lot on the stove. I, you know, I kept the stove going with like chili and soups and warm food. And, but you know, we were layered up. We had, you know, 
three to four different layers on. And when we slept, we slept with all the blankets on in our bedroom. But my husband had, you know, got the space heater in there. We kept that our bedroom closed at night. And it was fine. We were about, you know, 60 degrees, 62 degrees in there. We were comfortable. It was the front part of the house that was really cold. And, you know, living without lights, people don't understand. Because, you know, when it's snow, it's really dark. Outside, it's a little bit brighter. But really, the inside of our house was really dark. And it started to kind of affect me emotionally. I was just like, I want some light, you know. But we had no light. We had, you know, candles and votives. And we did have one lamp that could run off of the generator. So the generator could basically power that space heater, the lamp, the uh, inverter that my husband had for our cell phones. The tendency is to like start maybe panicking, but as long as you, I think as long as you think things through, you prepare in advance. And I think my husband and I survived really well because we've lived off grid. Okay, this is happening. How are we gonna deal with it? And so thank God I texted my friend, my cousins, and I said, hey, do y'all know where we can get gas? And my cousin's like, yeah, use the gas app and it'll tell you. And so I'm in the car, my husband's driving, we're slipping and sliding, there's all these other SUVs. We're all trying to get gas. And I get on the app and I'm like, okay, I'm like, honey, there's gas like two miles away. So we get there and it's like, it's really like the horde mentality, the herd mentality, I mean. If we all started like racing in, like trying to get our pumps so we could get our gas, so we could go back and you know run to the generator. We made it. And then on the sixth day, we got a little bit of power. It turned on for like maybe an hour and we were like, okay, okay. Uh, let's charge up whatever we can, then it went back off. So we had the rolling blackouts and those continued. And then by the end of the week, we did have, we, they finally established our power. And how we dealt with it was, you know, just use what resources we had. Uh, and then when we ran out of gas, you know, you have to go out. That's the, that's not the best situation. But at the same time, you know, gas only keeps for so long, you know, it's got a shelf life. So it's not like you can hoard gas. I mean, you can buy canned goods and keep those. And we do, you know, that's one of the things that came out of that lesson. Uh, and, and especially with COVID too, because that was happening during COVID. You know, Snowmageddon happened during COVID. So we had already, you know, I already started buying different things and keeping them uh, in our office just in case, you know, like, because when COVID hit in Texas and my bit, my, my workplace closed down uh, and I went to the store, the corner store, the corner CVS to get toilet paper because one of my, one of my fellow employees, like, I just came from the grocery store and people are like fighting over toilet paper. And I was like, what? So I was like, okay, well, maybe I need to stop and get toilet paper too. Like everybody, I mean, that's the natural, you know, human yeah. thing that we do. It's like, you know, COVID kind of taught us a little bit. I mean, I hope it did. It taught me, you know, you to, be, to be more. Clear. Yeah, you too. Yeah, that was when I really started being like, as a lifestyle, you know, like kind of just really amping up what I would do normally, which I mean, there was a time when I was a single mom, you know, and pregnant and and didn't make any money at all. So I like would just save whatever food I could stock up on, you know? And I think that's when I really started, but then when COVID hit, it was a lot more, you know? A lot more like preparations and prepping and all of that stuff. So yeah, what would you tell somebody who uh, is uh, worried about the like future rolling blackouts? Like what are your tips for that situation? I would say, except that it's, it's the new normal. I don't delude yourself in thinking that it can't happen to you. Go back in case you have to go. And I have two go bags prepared. Two go bags, one closest, my front entrance in my hall, but it's protected. I have another go bag that's in the hallway because in Texas we get tornadoes. And we get, we can get some really bad tornadoes. So I have a go bag that's in my designated area where we have to, you know, take shelter um, when our sirens go off. So I would tell people, it will happen, prepare yourself and, and do the normal things that everybody tells you. Have a go bag, have some water and some food, have some cash. Uh, have your cell phones charged, you know, have, uh, you know, your important documents, make sure they're in firebox. I have a, a safe where I have our documents, uh, our IDs, things like that in case, you know, and, and what I think, even though Snowmageddon taught me different lessons, I've always been prepared for a tornado. In the North Texas area, tornadoes, especially because we're one hour from Oklahoma where we live at in Texas and Oklahoma gets hit so hard. So I would tell people this basic preparation, uh, don't go overboard because, and this is a funny story, we, when we bought our cabin, we needed some propane refrigerators because we use propane up here. And my husband's watching on Craigslist and eBay, and he found a guy whose father was like a, a super prepper. He had two storage sheds full of things, like he had two propane refrigerators, and he had all these different things, and he... We bought one, we paid for one. He's like, well, you just take the other one. I have to get rid of all of my dad's stuff. Because his dad had passed, but his dad had so much prep and then he didn't even need it. So I would say, be reasonable in your prepping. 
uh, and prepping is just short for preparation. And that's what any smart person will do is just think, think ahead, you know, plan for the rainy day. And then also, you know, prepare for the worst, hope for the best, right? That's what how we should live our lives. That's a good philosophy, whether it's a natural disaster or even war. I mean, think about the people in the Ukraine. How are they, sir? They don't have electricity. They don't have clean running water. I mean, people in war-torn areas, they have to adapt everybody to get a small generator. I've told all my children, please get a generator. Please get a generator. Please just get one generator and extension cords. And, uh, you know, have a couple of coolers, you know, where you can, you know, if you have to get ice from outside to keep your some of your food cold, do that. You know, just basic, I think, kind of common sense. I didn't have so much fear, fear. And I think part of that is because I'm a country girl at heart and I've played out in the woods. I've, you know, I've experienced a lot of crazy things in my lifetime. And I too once was a single mom and with two young children and going to university and you, you know, when you're a single mom, you're a mama bear and you figure things out on the fly. And so I didn't have fear, but what I had was, how long is this going to go on? And I thought, okay, I can go without a week, without a bath, a shower. And that's what I did. You know, I may do with face wipes, <laughs> you know, thank God I had some lavender and rose scented face wipes. I take my makeup off at night and I would just, you know, use those and try to keep myself as clean as I could. And it was just the uncomfortable part, but I was more worried for like my neighbors because I have some elderly neighbors uh, uh, and I checked up on them, you know, and some brought the way and thank god most of us had i think all of us on our blog had fireplaces i ran out of firewood it's so funny as we ran out of firewood i was just like kicking myself we should have more firewood but then i remember oh my god i have all that driftwood that i brought home up for my daughter you know she was going to make a wedding arch because somebody a bride wanted a birch wood so my husband's like we're gonna have birch wood and we burned the birch wood so it was just problem solving i don't think you know afraid of anything or fearful i think it was uncomfortable and now there's my doggy barking if it was if it was a tornado and my house got obliterated and i was in it i have felt real fear when the tornado sirens come so i can tell you that and I, maybe that's why um maybe that's why i wasn't so afraid because we've lived through the fear of your roof being blown off and you know a mattress isn't going to help you if the roof you know falls down on you so that's i think so, yeah, yeah it's so true in it. and you know you, th you see the footage of people in Oklahoma and Mississippi and you know all the storms that we've had all the tornadoes and people losing their lives I knew we weren't gonna freeze to death although some people did and so that's how some people lost their lives and there's some people that were you know when you have a generator don't put your generator in your house you know and my husband had it in the garage and I said honey we need to take it out of the garage and let's just put it you know right outside and he's like yeah but I'm afraid somebody's gonna come by and steal it and I'm like okay well let's just kind of camouflage it you know because yeah you know when Astro keeps going on and on and on and it changes people's behavior and their emotions, that would be very scary if I had to come up against that. You know, if, if I had to experience looting, which I never have, or somebody coming in the moment, taking what we have because they don't have, that would be terrifying. And that thought did cross my mind, but I thought, you know, we've got guns. If it comes to something like that, which is crazy, you don't ever want to think like that. You don't ever want to think that you would have to turn against a neighbor. Uh, and one of your guests has said, you know, community. And so, you know, in our block, we were all texting each other. Are you okay? Are you okay? I texted my favorite neighbor across the street, Aunt. How are you doing? She goes, we're fine. We've got plenty of firewood. Bill's making chili and, you know, he's drinking a little bourbon. And so, you know, community. Um, I like when your one of your guests has said community is a really good asset because I agree with that. Yeah, I do too. I feel like a lot of people feel like that they kind of overlook that aspect, but I definitely feel like in my life, at least, I've seen a lot of care from community in times of trouble. I agree. I, agree. I think, and you know, and there's the kindness of strangers too uh, that comes into play. But for me, if if I and, and the other the other thing I will tell you, I was worried about. I wasn't worried about my father because he was fine, and thank God my mother was fine too because she lives close to the police station, so they kept the power on because you know they have essential services. So I was I was fine, and my daughter was fine, and my son had experienced a little bit of the rolling blackouts at his house, but you know, I think I would probably worry most about my children first, uh, then, then myself second. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's true. I was talking to a lady the other day who was talking a lot about um, people maybe they've been through like a flood or a wildfire or something like that where like the the parents live and maybe the child doesn't and they have to deal with like survivor grief a lot mm -hmm. and I think that would be you know thank God it's something I haven't ever had to deal with but I think that would be really hard. No 
250 deaths doesn't sound like a lot, especially when you kind of juxtapose that against like some of like that catastro those catastrophic earthquakes, the one that they had in Turkey last year that was just terrifying. And you know, in Pakistan, they had those those flash flooding monsoons and so many people died and so many people are without food. So when I put it in that perspective, in which I did at the time when Snowmageddon was going on, I was just like, okay, this is really uncomfortable. It's very cold in the house. It's very dark, but at least at night, you know, we have a warm bedroom and we kept the dogs in there with us. We would just shut the door at night. Um, and of course you wake up early and hope, you know, oh my God, is the power gonna come back on so I can take a shower. And then you, you realize we take all this so much for granted when it, when everything gets stripped away and we still had our four walls, we still had our roof. So for me, I thought this is, you know, this is just a survival lesson, but my husband was like, we'll be fine. And we were, we were, and we were probably better off than most. You know, there were people that were living in their cars, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, and can you imagine your whole family in your car, staying in that car like for five or six days? It's just, you know, <laughs> maybe not all of them will walk out of that car <laughs> <laughs> after five days. <laughs> Somebody might not make it. <laughs> yeah, my stepkids, we went to, where was it, Catalina Island, and we get on the island, and they're already starting to fight each other, and I'm trying to get in the middle of them, and I'm like, stop fighting, guys. <laughs> I can't imagine if we were stuck stuck in one car for five days. We finally got the TV back on, and, you know, then there was all the different stories and different news reports, and there were people who, you know, were in their cars, in their apartments, under their carport, and I just thought, okay, count your blessings. Count your blessings. It wasn't that bad for you, so... Um, that's just the way I look at it. I was just like, you know, it was, it's a story I have to tell now, you know, but we made it, we did, it was unco very uncomfortable. Uh, but at the end of the day, it could have been so much worse for us. And there were people, a lot of people in our neighborhood that their pipes burst. Uh, they had left to go at, to go at a hotel, you know, the hotels were all booked, you know, you hear about that. Uh, but then when they come back and their pipes have burst and then their house is flooded, to me, that would be a nightmare. You know, just coming back and seeing all your stuff underwater, it's just, you know, so. In, or my stupid ex-boyfriend caught my apartment on fire. Oh my God. And then like, but the water got stuck on. So like everything got, like the fire department couldn't get it to turn off. It took him like an hour. So it was just dumping water for a whole hour. I mean, it was like, I lost everything in my apartment. It was all just destroyed from water. So besides like the pots and pans, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I'm so sorry that happened to you, but that did happen to a lot of the apartment complexes in Dallas because when the pipes would freeze, especially the ones that had, you know, the people on the bottom, you know, all the people on the top, all their water would come down and just wash away. So there was so much damage from Snowmageddon that, you know, it's in the billions of dollars. And the le I hope the lesson learned is that, it, and it is because they monitor the grid now. On our news, they actually will show us how the grid is performing when it's getting too close to reaching its capacity to produce the energy, to pro you know, for all of our homes. And then they'll tell us, you know, they, my, my daughter is actually house sitting. And she said, I said, how, what's the temperature? It was like 110 last week. She goes, it's about 80 degrees in the house. And my husband's like, tell her to turn it down. And I said, your dad says to turn it down. She goes, no, we have to keep it at 78 because the grid will fail if we don't. So, and I was like, good girl, keep it at 78 because you don't want the grid to fail. So they did have a couple of rolling blackouts last week, but you know, that's our new normal. So we do have to prepare, you know, and I said, put the fan near you. And I called my mom, I said, mom, she's like, I have a box fan. I have a ceiling fan. I'm right underneath it. The dogs are cool. So, you know, I think everybody needs to think ahead and in the wintertime, summertime, springtime, when tornadoes come, you need to have your generator and you need to have a, a space heater for winter. You need to have fans for the summer. Um, and then the rest of the time you need to be able to, to take off if you have to, you know, if they give you the warning, Hey, uh, stuff is about to happen. You need to, you know, especially with people from hurricanes, you know, okay, this category five is about to hit in your neighborhood. You've got three hours and then you start trying to, you know, all your emotions take over and you're like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? So you don't want to be in that situation. You already want to have that bag ready. And yeah. You got to think about, yeah, you got to think about, okay, I need underwear. I need some face wipes. I need uh, my charger in there. I need a bottle of water, a flashlight, you know, put all your things in your go bag. And I have those two go bags and one of them is so heavy because I've got so much stuff in there. And I'm like, this is my end of the world go bag. And this is my go bag for, uh, you know, if I have to just get out of Dodge because uh, the grid's gonna fail and, and we're gonna just, you know, go back up to the, the cabin. So I found you because I have a podcast as well. It's called The Earthy Girls. And we actually have had a couple of podcasts on emergency preparedness. Um, because we figure that that is always a good topic to talk about. But basically our podcast is we're a mother daughter duo and we love the planet and all things green. So we try to talk about ways that you can impact and protect mother earth by taking just one small step every day, you know, and our tagline is, 
consider this, it's not an inconvenience, but it's an investment in the future generations. So we talk about gardening, you know, we talk about how to dry herbs, because if you think about long-term, if everything changes in our world and our new world normals, we have to go back to way to the ways that our ancestors and our, our grand grandparents and great, great grandparents live. You know, we do need to understand about which herbs are medicinal. We do need to understand what, about what plants we can eat, what we can harvest, you know? So we talk a lot about things like that. And my daughter's studying to be an herbalist. I'm a gardener. I've been a gardener now for 30 years. I, I grow my own food. Um, so we talk about things like that, but we also like to try to keep it light. We talk a little bit about, you know, we did Plastic Free July, so we we're really honing in on our messages. You know, what can you switch and what can you ditch? And then stop using the single use plastics like plastic water bottles. You can buy yourself a Yeti or a reusable water bottle. You know, buy your own grocery bag so you don't have to have plastic grocery bags and straws and then to go containers. So we talk about stuff like that. And then we also, you know, just kind of chit chat back and forth as a mother and daughter and our experiences. And so uh, you can find us uh, anywhere you listen to podcasts, Earthy Girls. And then on Instagram, we are at earthygirl.co and uh, we do give away, you know, like we had a giveaway for how to start your pollinator garden. And we've done some uh, detox your domain episodes where, you know, when we get too much uh, chronic fatigue, too much um, brain fog, achy joints, even, you know, when you're young and you shouldn't have that, we want to, you know, share our wisdom and share that with the world, you know, how to, you know, live a more healthier, eco-friendly lifestyle. So that's really what the Earthy Girls are about, you know, in this cabin. You know, we have solar and I'm glad that we have solar today because, you know, I could have light in my cabin, but you know, there's days when it's really cloudy and when really windy up here, we don't have any power. So, you know, we, you, you adapt. I think adaptability is probably the biggest thing that helped us is like we're climate change and with, you know, excessive weather extremes that's happening, that our new normal is that, you know, we will all probably experience some kind of natural, you know, natural disaster. She survived category five, Hurricane Andrew in Florida. You want to make sure you listen to her tips. Make sure to click this video right here because it will tell you so many amazing tips about surviving natural disasters. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and check out prepperqueen.com.